The centurion and those who were keeping watch with him said, Truly, this was the Son of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. Well, that was quite a lot to take in, don't you think? I mean, my goodness. Of all the services throughout the year, I think this is the one that has the greatest range of emotions. Right? The whole service starts off with great joy and celebration as Jesus enters Jerusalem. All glory, laud, and honor to the Redeemer King. And then it ends with sorrow and despair as Jesus dies. And it's heart-wrenching. And so what are we supposed to make of everything that we just read and how do we put it together? Well, there are many ways I think you could do it, and there's lots of themes and things throughout these readings, but one just jumped out to me in almost every single scene of all these readings. In almost every single one, the people repeatedly proclaim the same thing about Jesus. Sometimes they do it in praise, sometimes they do it in jest. But regardless, all throughout, the people in this story proclaim that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ. Jesus is King. Let me give you just three examples, and you could easily go to many others within the text. And the obvious place to start is at the beginning, with the triumphal entry. Jesus is about to enter Jerusalem for the last time, and the people who've been following him for quite a while are absolutely ecstatic. They couldn't be more excited about what's happening. The king is about to enter his holy city, ascend his throne, and now we have to throw him a parade in celebration. I remember way back when I was a kid, the Washington Redskins could actually win football games. And I remember one year when they had won the Super Bowl, my mom decided to take me down to the celebration parade as it came through. And there were people everywhere, and they were happy. They were rejoicing and singing, hail to the Redskins, hail victory. They were chanting, they were cheering. There was food and drink and confetti and cheers and clapping. And as the vans and the buses rolled by, everybody just lost their mind. It was exciting and thrilling. And that's what I have in my mind as Jesus enters Jerusalem. These people are celebrating by giving Jesus the red carpet treatment, laying down their own garments and palm branches. They shout, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. The king is here. He's finally come. The wait is over. Thanks be to God. No wonder they're so excited. But the tone quickly changes as we move to the next scene. After Jesus is condemned by Pilate, he's handed over to soldiers. And they treat him miserably. Pilate may have washed his hands of the situation, but these soldiers had not. As one commentator describes it, these soldiers celebrate Jesus by giving him a fool's costume that mimics and mocks his identity as a king. He's given fake robes, fake scepter, and even a crown not of golden beauty, but of thorny pain, and it's placed on his head. Then they kneel down and they pay homage to him, greeting him as if they would the emperor. Hail, king of the Jews. And then they spit on him and beat him with the scepter they had just handed to him. This is almost unthinkable to me. And how do we put it in today's context? And I'm thinking, what if we treated somebody who claimed to be president like this? We drape them in an American flag towel. Then we take a plastic eagle and pin it not to their chest, or not to their lapel, but directly into the chest. Then we give them a phone book to make their oath upon, and then beat them with that book. This is atrocious treatment. It's both verbal and physical abuse. And these soldiers cruelly attack our Lord and our King. And yet they were right in everything they said. Jesus is the King of the Jews. They didn't realize how right they were. And instead of celebrating him, they mock him. And yet in this last scene I want to discuss, they soon change their mind. Because after Jesus dies there on that cross, he is completely vindicated. 
The curtain of the temple is torn in two by God from top to bottom. The earth quakes, the rocks split, and even some of the dead rise from their graves. It's as if heaven and earth together proclaim in miraculous fashion that yes, this Jesus who died on that cross, he is the Son of God. He is the King. He is the Christ. And as miraculous as this scene is, I don't think it's the tearing of the curtain or the earthquakes or anything else, not even the dead rising from their graves, that's the real miracle here. I think it's what it says in Matthew 27, verse 54. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly this was the Son of God. That's the miracle of the story. These same people who just moments earlier had spit upon, beat, mocked, and even killed Jesus, now see him for who he really is. Jesus is the King of the Jews. He is the Son of God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of David. Jesus Christ is King. Amen and amen. And so these long and emotional readings that we have just gone through, they all proclaim all throughout that Jesus is indeed the King. But in practical terms, what does this mean for us? Well, I like threes, so I have three quick things. First, Jesus is the sacrificed King. And because Jesus is the sacrificed King, that means our sins are completely washed away in the blood of the Lamb. Jesus was not killed. Jesus laid down his life in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. He became for us a sacrificial lamb on our behalf, which means that whatever mistakes, whatever mista uh, sins, whatever regrets we might have, they are now completely washed as white as snow. You don't have to feel guilty. You don't have to feel ashamed. You don't have to feel unwanted. Because Jesus, the sacrificial king, loves you forgives you, and now accepts you. Look, if even the soldiers who mocked and killed Jesus could be forgiven of what they did, you can be forgiven of whatever is on your heart this morning, too. And that should cause us all to say, thanks be to God. So that's first. Second, Jesus is our resurrected king. And because Jesus is our resurrected king, our resurrection is assured. Jesus was the first to rise from the dead, but he won't be the last. Because of Jesus, we too will rise from our graves. As we say week after week after week in the creed, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. That's our resurrection we're talking about, not Jesus's. We talked about Jesus's in the previous paragraph. This is ours. Because of Jesus, death is not the end for us. I know death makes me sad too. <laughs> but death isn't the end for us. Our eternal life goes on. And that brings us great hope. That's the foundation of the Christian hope, that our resurrection is secured. So Jesus is our sacrificed king, he's our resurrected king, and then finally, he's the king of kings. And because he's the king of kings, our lives belong to him, to him. We are called to be his faithful servants, to follow and imitate him in thought, word, and deed. And so I challenge you, as Lent comes to an end and we walk through Holy Week, ask yourself an important question. Is Jesus your king? Is Jesus your king? If not, bow down and make him your king today. Submit your life to him. It will be worth it, I promise. But if he is a king, let me give you some follow-ups to ponder on during this holy week as well. How is he your king? 
How is he the king of your heart? How is he the king of your thoughts and your attitudes? How is he the king of your family and your relationships? How is he the king of your work, your retirement, or your free time? How is he the king of your finances and what you give money to? How is he the king of your goals and your life's ambitions? Man, these are tough questions. And as I ask them of myself, I know they sting because they point out all these areas where I am the king, not him, and it needs to be the other way around. But as we ask these questions of ourselves and we ponder them, then with God's help, the answers can help us become better servants of our King and faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. So in all of our readings today, my dear friends, Jesus is celebrated as King, he is mocked as King, he's even vindicated as King. In other words, Jesus is King. So let's rejoice. King Jesus has washed away your sin. Let us have hope our resurrection awaits. And in the meantime, let us be faithful because he's not just the king of kings, he's our king too. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.